Welcome back to Sci-Fi and Fantasy Read Along. We are going to drop directly into Chapter 6, which is a direct continuation of Chapter 5. We're just dropping into it, huh? I don't see an alternative, to be honest. Uh, because the chapter begins as a direct continuation of Chapter 5, and um, this one's going to be a bit of a mess, I think. because I think it's, it's going to be a mess, yeah. It's a lot of talking with a little bit of setting change and a little bit of character change but mostly a lot of talking and uh, some revelations and even the character change isn't really a character change as we'll Not find really. out yeah, yeah. <laughs> chapter five ended with uh ronnie and barney discussing how they were going to save uh, leo bolero from the clutches of palmer Eldritz. and what they realized they searched the future papes and realized that if barney went to go help him or rescue him he was probably going to end up dead. So I think, right. I think he decided to do nothing. And so, yes, Chapter 6 begins where Leo Bolero left off, which was being attacked by a Gluck. And it's described. It's a parasite of some kind. It's draining his blood from the ankle. It's grabbed onto his leg and has penetrated his flesh with all the cilia-like siphons that is sucking out his fluids. When up shows uh, Palmer. Yeah, he has like a stick and he uh, fights that thing off. I, kind of go ahead, it. say it the way you want to say it, because I know you, I know you and Philip both want to say it in a particular way. What you mean, like beat it off or something? Like yeah, oh, I didn't even. <laughs> that get wasn't that. even in my head. No, totally different. Me neither. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Hard to believe. See, he said he poked at it and yeah. it went away. But just so you know. This is the first physical manifestation of Palmer Eldritch, and unfortunately it's not even the real Palmer Eldritch. Yeah, none of them have been the real Palmer Eldritch. Which one of these is not the real thing? Well, what I'm getting at is he's not really here. Or is he? I don't know. Where is here? This landscape. This whatever alternate reality, this copy of like PP layouts, the place where you go when you take choosy. So the thing about PP layouts is you need to purchase the street set. You need to get the baker or else you aren't going to get no bread, you know, that type of stuff. And using Choose Z, the person who's using it gets to create what's going on in the landscape that they're in. That's sort of true. It's sort of true. It sounds very interesting and a little bit less regulated as PP layouts. They even go into this later about the fact that there is some rules that go with PP layouts. You know, you can't just do anything is the more attractive uh, scenario. It's more attractive to Leo. It's one of his ways well, of Well, he's trying to defend his business. Yeah, exactly. I mean, a lot of this is him... Him saying, no, my, my drugs are better than your drugs. <laughs> yeah. We're getting way ahead of ourselves. And there's like this great epiphany, he says, when Leo Bolero chases the thing. He says, you were wrong, Eldritch said. He's like, I did not find God in the proc system, but I found something better. What did he find? Eldritch said, God promises eternal life, but I can do better. I can actually deliver it. I'm just saying he's deifying himself. In fact, he's more than deifying himself. Or he's an atheist and he just puts no value in God whatsoever. What if he's just being literal, Philip? If he's being literal, that he can provide eternal life, then that's that's something amazing. That's worth looking into, yeah. Because we find out tons and tons of details about what happens when you chew choosy in this chapter. And one of the one of the side effects is that time does not pass. You can spend a literal eternity inside of Choosy's dimension and only like a blink of an eye will pass. Pretty awesome. Eldritch tries to explain the difference between Choosy and Candy and explain why it's better. And, and Palmer comes out and says, you know, he's lived a hundred years in this dimension or other dimensions or whatever he's doing. And he's learned, he's evolved. And he said he's taken Candy in every way possible, like boil. In and enema. I don't think he gave that example. Yeah, he did. No, he said it's suppository. Oh, he did? I mean, it's not yeah. the same thing, but he took it up the butt. Well, it's funny how either I didn't read that part or I just... You it's know. like we've switched positions today. We've switched roles. <laughs> <laughs> ATN's all about the butt today. Because <laughs> he feels like ass. I guess so. Mm -hmm. So playing off the idea that you can live a lifetime on one dose of choosy in just a matter of seconds in real life, that is a direct competition to candy where you get like 20, maybe 30 minutes. Almost no time. Yeah. Playing in the pet perky pat. Mm -hmm. And that's like, like you said, no time at all. 
it leaves you wanting more. It leaves you disappointed. And you already live in a very morose situation on the colonies. Hence the disappointment, right? But the thing is, is as a businessman, uh, as a person that's, you know, as the drug dealer, you want people to want it. As a businessman, as a, as Bolero, you know, he wants to to give that fix out there to keep the thing going. You want to get a new Perky Pat layout. Well, he also never had competition, so he didn't have to make a real streamlined business. That's true. I mean, he is going to have to um, figure out something, but I don't think you know, he's murder going is to. always an option. Murder is an option. <laughs> the commercialization and the customization of the PP layout model is, I think, is pretty amazing. You know, you can create whatever model you want to. For a price. For a price, right? Because you have to buy the layouts. You pay to win. If I had my choice, like, I would not want to be limited to PP layouts and Walt and Perky Pat. But we like if somebody somebody else would get in this market, they would actually create these huge hotels or whatever, uh, recreational areas. Holodecks. Holodecks, where they create vast layouts that you could go into and experience way beyond your So you'd pay a little bit to go to experience this and then, or go experience them in France or on the beach or all these other things. You wouldn't have to invest all yourself. And then I, was, I realized, oh, wait, it's, it's illegal. So you can't have those businesses, but... You could still do it underground. There'd be a limit to what you could experience. You couldn't do a sci-fi perky pat. People were making their own. You know, it's like a 3D printer. You could absolutely print your own men's oh true yeah you know i didn't even think you could have that. anything you want and and like the size might be at limit because you have to keep it underground on the black market but mm -hmm. other than that like i think you could still get a great variety of different layouts all right so phil i mean it's pretty obvious you know it's dm phil doesn't want to be limited to perky pat layouts too much choice can actually block an individual and let's not forget these are all people from the colonies that pine for earth or Perky patch. True, true. But, but at the same time, it's just like when you go to a restaurant and they've got like 500 things on the menu, like, I hate that. Hopefully they make one of them well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Eldridge came clean on how he seduced or sold the idea to Hepburn Gilbert and the UN into buying into it because Elbert, sorry, Hepburn Gilbert was a Buddhist and the concept of reincarnation in their belief system, again, as a religious experience, was a huge selling point to to him. You could be a bug, a physics teacher, a hawk, a protozoan, a slime mold, a streetwalker in Paris in 1904. Anything you want. It's like, as ATN said, the ultimate holodeck. Do you see any reason why that should be appealing to a Buddhist? They believe in reincarnation. And yeah, but you're not actually dying. You're just going and pretending to be somebody else for as long as you want to. No, I, I well, just me. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not a Buddhist, but I just, I think I comprehend on a surface, surface, superficial level. I think if you experience life as a bug for a hundred years, I think that qualifies as living in another life. Okay, so interesting. That would be fun. You have to earn enlightenment. You can't just. But take if you have a hundred years. Yeah, I guess I see what you're saying. The problem is that it's all derived from your mind or the mind of somebody right. who's in control. Because it sounded to me a little bit like Bolero was inside of Palmer Eldritch's universe sure. and he was not in control. Not only was he not in control, well, he was to some degree, a but only if, with the allowance. Official. Ultimately, as this uh, chapter goes on, and of course, you know, we know what Barney is saying uh, with uh, Ronnie. This is definitely a prison he's in. Oh, yeah. He's not in a, a magic wonderland. If you are in somebody else's world that you can't control, then I might as well just put some bars around you. He's being you're in prison. tortured. First, Palmer Eldritch is trying to seduce him. Then he threatens him. You know, Well, he shows him possibilities, and then he threatens him. Ultimately, this whole chapter, it's very, very religious and philosophical-based on seems to me like almost every level like i had to look up a lot of this stuff like logos which is reason so blair brings up the king james bible and for, for whatever reason he's using it as a ward against palmer eldritch don't that won't work here and he disintegrates it he's basically using wishful thinking there's a lot of times he pro proclaims in his head god uh bolero does you know he's like god don't let this happen to me that type of thing uh, you'd think uh, uh, someone who's gone through as much e-therapy, he might have uh, dropped that. 
Well, it's interesting because they go into this huge discussion. Uh, they, sorry, I hate pronouns. Eldritch and Leo go into this huge discussion about how real is choosy versus um, um, candy. candy. And they t say exactly the same thing. It's a transcendent experience. He said, and they're talking about how choosy is going to take over the market um, by not just promising transcendence, but but literally giving it to you. And it would. And it would, yeah. Because you're not transcending for 20 or 30 minutes. You're transcending. As long as you want. Yeah. Yep. And that, that would be very attractive to people like Sam Reagan. Yeah. Who, in his chapter, was like, I want something more. I want something better. Yeah. Well, Eldritch calls those people who believe in that are fanatics because it's not real. It's an illusion. That's referring not to choosy, but candy. Yeah, to candy. Yes, exactly. I apologize. So Eldritch is calling candy transcendence. And the people that believe it's religious experience, they said they're fanatics that are they're not they're not really there yet. But he's promising a real, effectively, religious experience. And yeah, I agree. Reagan would absolutely go for it. And you had argued at the time that Reagan thought of it as a religion, and I didn't. I didn't get that. I didn't see it at the time. But now that I have Eldritch explaining it here. It does seem clear that there are lots of people who really do believe they transcend their bodies and go into uh, either Perky Pad or Walt. They go to a different well, it's place. Well, like it's the whole communion thing, right? And then isn't that more happening with candy, though, yeah. than uh, with Choosy? I mean, here we we know that Palmer Eldritch is is here controlling things and Leo's here. That's a subtle thing. Like it's, it took me some effort to figure out like how right. little control Leo actually had and how much control. Well, I was just thinking as far as like candy is concerned, if there's more than one or two men or more than two men or one man, I should say, uh, all of them have to work in concert to make Walt work, you know? Sure. And that's, uh, kind of a religious thing also, you know, everybody giving in to the, to the one, basically. I agree. You know, on some level, their consciousness is merging into one being. And I'd say that's a transcendent experience by itself. Well, I mean, think about it like, uh, you know, we have our loved ones. And then how many other people do you have that kind of like close association with, really? You know, doing candy and getting in a perky pat. I mean, it could be... Freaky deaky, <laughs> as it's been in the past, obviously, for those people. Maybe I'm conservative, <laughs> but I don't have a single person in my life that I would want to share that experience with. I mean, as a dude. <laughs> well, I understand. Yeah, and the thing is, though, it's never been. But, hmm. Yeah, I mean, I understand. Uh, I mean, I would not want me and Atien to uh, go. Me either. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. To whatever, do something inappropriate with Perky Pad in some imaginary world. Well, you're not. You're controlling Walt, and Walt's doing it, and you're, I mean... No, but if he wasn't there, I would do it. But it's, that's a private right. thing. <laughs> that's a private thing. In this, with Choosy, you can create a Walt, beat the hell out of him, and then talk to Perky Pat later on, you know? You, you control it. <laughs> Do you? Well, I mean, if you are the one in control, supposedly. Which is not a guarantee. It seems to me like by the end of the first half of this chapter, I was fairly convinced that everybody was just going to be imprisoned. Uh-huh. Where you maybe don't have any control. Maybe right. you're just sedated. Yeah. Well, who's to say Palmer Eldritch is the one that's controlling this area? There's this no thing. one to say that he is. He's saying it. Yeah, but who is he? Under control of the proxies, I hear. That's kind of what it seems like. But why did he say that in the first place? He's trying to bend Bolero right now. He's got right. Bolero over a barrel. He is trying to convince him to give up candy. He's trying to convince him to hand his company over so that they can use, so that <clears throat> Palmer Eldritch can use his distribution network, his his growing vats on wherever they are, Venus or whatever. So before Leo created out of thin air the Bible... The first thing he did was made a gluck trap, and that was cool. This is where the logos came in. Palmer Eldritch was trying to convince Leo that you could create anything your mind wanted to create in here, and he said, create something. You know, you were kind of expecting he was going to do something. He obviously has a certain type of woman. You know, maybe he would have done something like that. He's all business, remember? Pardon me? He knows that he's doing business right now. Sure. 
Sure, sure. He's not being fanciful. But right. but the Gluck track worked, and the Gluck went it in, did. and the lid sh- slammed shut, and it got vaporized. That amused Palmer for sure, I think. No, Palmer was like, holy crap. Yeah. <laughs> Don't make a trap well. for me, please. <laughs> well, he did. I mean, again, I thought that was business talk, trying to be amiable with Affable. each other. and Maybe so. Yeah. Maybe so. But I think there was some legit. I, you know, it's hard to say, but the, Eldritch did say, if you die in this world, you die in the real world. So I think on some level. Do you buy that? I, he, whatever. At this point, I, I go with what he says. I mean, let's go with this entire portion of the chapter because, like I said, nothing's really going on. It's just a lot of information. So, like, based on all of the information you've garnered from this part of the chapter, do you think that's true? Yes. No, I Why? think it's well. I think it's fake. I mean, just I don't <laughs> think it's true either. Well, I, because of the little girl, because of the strangulation. Case in point, Monica shows up again from last chapter, and we find out that it's not a little girl. It's not the version of Zoe we thought it was. Is it Zoe? Is his daughter's name? It was uh, Leo that suspected it might be her, but right. But but Palmer Eldred says no. That was me. Just like another version. It sounds like it's a uh, it's a piece of him he allowed to exist, like the or gluck. something like that. Kind of like a gluck, and, yeah. And for all of you philosophy folks out there, he literally said, take the medieval doctrine of substance versus accident, which is like met- metaphysics and philosophy and religion. And he was applying it to himself. And I had to look some of that, but the truth is I didn't really get it because that's... That- we discussed that stuff a little bit in Chapter 3, I think, when we were on Mars. Do you guys want to talk about the gluck? What part? Who made the gluck? Oh, Eldritch made it. He did it so that he could show Eldritch that there was a, a life and death component in this area. And that he allowed it to be... Every other thing that gets made isn't going to hurt you. But this one I allowed to hurt you. So that you, you knew. Isn't I that think what there's some pretty significant um, meaning to what the Gluck is. Based on the previous chapter. Which I had the privilege of recently editing. So I have, I'm fresh on that topic. Oh, the lightness. Yes. He said, Leo Bolero, when encountering that creature, said that it was not made by a Terran mind. Mm. Oh. Well, I kind of remember that. But I also, just to segue into pain and fear are the best teachers. So if you live in a utopian world where there is no pain and there's no fear, you, you don't evolve. You stagnate. So you create something that is always a constant threat, even at a low at, at a low level, like a scorpion. I'm not afraid of a scorpion, but gosh darn it, if one like jumps out at me, I'm I'm gonna take a shiver, right? I'm gonna stomp it or avoid it or something else. Does that make sense? There was a Star Trek movie where there's this like utopian universe they go to, and this may be a part of that where you are always felt happy and everything is warm, and and Kirk eventually hates living there because he's like. There's no thrill. If there's no risk, there's 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 no thrill to life. And I kind of feel that Eldritch is trying to say kind of the same thing, is that you have to create something in your universe to give life meaning. And and sometimes a threat is a part of that, that dark part of humanity. And Leo goes into that. He's like, well, why can't I just create the most vicious, horrible things imaginable and, and do those things? And he's like, well, you can He's like, why? Everybody can in your own universe. Homer Eldritch, as Monica said, you can do whatever you want. You're alone in your... And she stopped. So I'm like, well, are you alone in your universe? Because that, that, sounds, that sounds unfulfilling to me. And But you can be there for eternity, creating whatever imaginary nonsense you want. And you can leave at any time. That's true, but if you're... And Leo's like, no, can you? I was trying to leave all this time, man. Can you? Well, Leo can't leave. I think if you're in prison, you're in prison. I think that the the notion of like you can leave any time is just a temporary measure to convince Leo to do what they want, but in reality, nobody's leaving. Well, but it's contradictory because you have Eldritch Palmer and you have Leo Palmer in here. Eldritch. Sorry, Palmer Eldritch and Leo Blair are in here, but but so clearly you're not alone in your own universe. But here she said, "Oh, you're alone in your So are you alone? Or are you not alone? I don't have an answer, yeah. but if you're truly alone, I don't want to play. I would like I would do it for a while, but then I get bored. You know what I mean? Well, again, that's where the perky pat's better. 
even if you don't have a dishwasher. Well, Leo wants to leave. He wants to get out of there. He doesn't like it here anymore. And he builds a staircase to go back to New York. And it does. It takes him... Uh, it takes him into the sun, right? He has to like run under a building. Well, not, in, those... not in the sun. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. Um, it's it's hot, though. Um, he gets one of those sky buses or something. And uh, sky cab. It's a jet cab, yeah. Jet cab, that's what it's called. And you know, he, he actually, I think they said it really well. He said it was it was hard to breathe. And uh, I'm trying to, yeah, he said almost unable to breathe. Have you guys ever been in a furnace? No, no. I, I, I think the hottest I've ever been was like 220 degrees. And I'm not kidding. At that hot, I mean, you, you can barely breathe. I'm sure your lungs don't want you to. Well, let's talk about the part where he's back in New York now. And let's let's go out on the record right now and just say that he's not really back in New York. No, this is all. But there's a whole up. lot of stuff going on here. And I think this is the torture. I think this is literally the torture scene. Yeah. How could he have really thought that he was leaving to go to New York, though? I don't know, man. Wishful thinking. There is a torture part in this for sure. It's Leo's fault in the beginning, though, for giving in. <laughs> Leo was fighting it, but Paul Moretta said you could do whatever you want in your universe. You just have to will it into into reality. And so I think... But this is not his universe. Exactly. And he knew that going... I mean, he knew that. I don't think he really knew it. Do you know what I mean? I think he heard the words, but he didn't like internalize those words. That might be true. Until he sees that little thing under his desk. Well, right? a powerful personality yeah. isn't going to take it at face value. I'm like, don't tell me I can't do anything until I try and try and try. I mean, you have to prove to me that I'm... And it was believable. I mean, Leo's always going to push the boundaries. Just killing that Gluck that way was uh, proof of that. Yep. But, you know, learn the lessons that are being taught. It's going to be hard if you don't, you know, if you don't pay attention. Yes, to but Leo absolutely believed that he was in New York in PP mm -hmm. layouts, dealing with Miss Gleason, his secretary, dealing with Ronnie, dealing with Barney, until they found that thing under his desk, and it was not a Gluck. He said it was worse and more disgusting than a Gluck, and then it scurried away and it like slid underneath the doorway, and he's like, "All right, fine, Eldritch, I give up. You win." He doesn't give up before. Oh, but he, if, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's this horrible part, which I have excised from my mind because it was so horrible. So he decides to take revenge on Ronnie because she rejected him. He says, are you really Mayerson's mistress? And she's like, yeah. And he's like, and you rejected me. So now I'm going to see what happens when, you know, we make you 100 years old. Do you think it's not just like, I think in a way it was kind of like, um, yeah, he's upset, but he knows she's not real. He's already uh -huh. said, this isn't a real world. This is kind of like that Stephen R. Donaldson thing. Where uh, most definitely. Most definitely. He decides to torture her, but he knows it's not really her. He's using his own problems. You know, why wouldn't you go out with me? Because I'm older than you. He doesn't well, like what do you like exactly? when you're as old as I am? Or how about this? You're older than me. Yeah. And the problem is that she keeps um, aging, I guess, until she becomes like a puddle, right? Yeah, he ages her down because apparently, like, Monica shows up at some point in time and is like, no, she only lives to be 70 years old, which is like, how do you know that? Uh, well, it's just like he said, he, yeah, wanted to punish her. And it's so I'm getting confused here over is this Leo, into, like, creating something? Or is it um, Eldritch hearing what he said and creating something to torture his mind? That's what I thought at the end. Leo aged up Ronnie to get back at her for pretend. But it was Palmer that took her to that next level where it was really super creepy. If he didn't know he wasn't in charge before, he definitely knows now, right? Oh, yeah. What I read and my mind created from the words was like a horror movie. It was disturbing to me. And she's all like, Leo. Yeah, but she turned into a puddle, but it's still moving. Because yeah. really, she, yeah. she died, but she, he made her live but on. But he willed her into existence, so she's alive. This dead thing's alive. She yeah. lived for 30 more years, and she continued to evolve. Oh, it's horrible. Yeah, pretty bad. Um, Barney Mayerson comes back, and he's like, Ugh, what have you done? And this is when um, Leo admits defeat. He says, Palmer, I give up. You win. Uh, you win. And he returns 
from New York back to the grassy plain where he'd been encountering both Monica and Palmer Eldridge. And I believe it's still Monica. Still Monica. Right? Yeah. Yeah. He's, they say, um, I don't have the page. Uh, there's a mention that, oh, I wasn't going to be able to affect anything anyway from before mm-hmm. in, before this situation. Do you remember that? No. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll see if I can find it. Yeah, well, he does say that, you know, I have a little bit of power over this world. I can do something. Um, and maybe that's true. Maybe it's just the, uh, whatever, a false a false belief in power. Like the, the illusion of choice, looking at an infinite menu, that kind of thing. Um, but just, I had this thought. And so when Ronnie did get liquefied, as it were... Um, Monica said she will, she's not going to live to be 70 or she's only going to live to be 70. Do you think she made that up or is Palmer Eldritch actually prescient and can see that far in the future? Based on the Terrans at the spaceship at the end of the chapter, I would say that you can access the actual future with this stuff. Whoa. Even though it may be phantom like. I think you can still access it. So I think on some level he is prescient. But on way in excess of what any other Terran can do at this point. And he might not be Terran. Oh, oh did you get the fact he had like a fake arm in the beginning? Yeah, yeah. it's from the, the crash, remember? I remember the crash, but it it was never mentioned at all what he looked like. We've never had it. Well, a... this is the first time we've had a description of him yes. at all. What may or may not be true, but it did say he had a fake arm, prosthetic right. arm. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. And and look at the cover of the book that's the thumbnail. Yep, exactly. It's got that fake arm. Perfect, perfect thumbnail. So I'm wondering if that's one of his stigmata. Losing an arm? The fake arm, yeah. It's a wound, right? It's the wound. But, I mean, would that make him Jesus? Well, well um... Remember the logos thing? It's attributed to Jesus, even though it's not. When it comes to the religious de- definition of logos, it's a little bit different than the... Well, he is here saying that he's offering, like, uh, everlasting life or reincarnation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to say this. I don't think any of us are, you know... Qualified? Ecclesiastical, scholarly enough to... I hope none of our audience is, too. And and I I apologize to everybody that, yes, I went to Sunday school. Yes, I read the Bible. But, you know, I'm not a biblical scholar or religious scholar. And this is heavy on religious philosophy. It's on the... um... The popularized version of religious philosophy, though? Sure. I mean, it's it's such a superficial approach to religious philosophy. It is also not clearly expressed. I don't walk away understanding the situation or the philosophy. I walk away understanding that Philip K. Dick was interested in this stuff. Yes. And, and he's making it entertainment for us. He wrote this religious stuff for himself and his religious explorations. And that's great. We can pick up some nuggets, but this is not a teaching book. It's just something no. that we, we're not comprehending because we're not comprehending Phillips K. Dick religious mind. Phillips K. Dick? Philip K. Dick. All of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So the negotiations are over, though, correct? Oh, wait. No, we haven't got there. No, we haven't got there yet. So now is when, pretty much when that happens. No, hey, the threat. Because what have you said? Something about the threat. The threat finally comes. Yeah. He's been, Palmer Aldrich has been nice. He's been polite. He's trying to be convincing. He's trying to make a deal. And now Leo has been belligerent, and he says a bad word. Leo says the word bastard, and Monica says, you are not going to use language like that. You really aren't, because I won't let you. What a silly, silly thing to give a shit about. We've been all religious, 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 but he said goddamn right in front of Palmer. No, he never did. A bastard? He said bastard. And yeah. now Eldritch gets upset and he says, you're not going to do that. And he says, this is how it's going to be. Is this when he strangles a little girl? No, this is like, when he well, gives terms. No, oh. yeah, you're going to hand over everything and that's the way it's going to be. So uh, Bolero, Leo gets sick, like physically sick. Oh, you're, no, 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 you're way ahead. No, no, no. He got no, sick not. after he saw Ronnie and he's made so it back. So he's come back. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Palmer you're, Eldridge you're right. has said this stuff. He's right. You're right. And then he uh, he gets sick. He says that his body isn't going to last, even though I'm a phantom ectoplasmic thing. He feels like he's going to, you know, die. And he gets sick and he throws up. And then when he gets up, Palmer Eldritch slash Monica says, 
Now we're going to talk terms. He said he was going to retire, basically. It's like, we're, we're taking your stuff, and, and you're going to retire, terms? and that's the way it's going to yeah, be. Your, all of your plantations, your transports, your ships, your infrastructure, your your people, they're going to be ours. They're now. like, well, we'll get to making a Perky Pat style thing, but, you know, that's not really important right now. <laughs> he said that's for the transition. Exactly. But literally, he says, I'm taking everything. And so it, those are the terms. And he doesn't even say, I'm going to give you anything in return. Did you notice that? He's, I, I did. I mean, I kind of assumed he'd still get a payoff. <laughs> but he didn't mention one. It's hard to divest yourself from a very, you know, a bought company without taking some money. <laughs> but he says, no, everything you have is going to be ours. And he didn't even yeah. say, and in return, we'll give you this. But he didn't say that. He just said, we're right. taking everything. So he strangles Monica? He does. He uh, So firstly, we think here that this is real enough to where if someone dies... It's been told to us. It's been told to Leo that if someone dies here, you die in real life. Permadeath. And and, uh, and like that Stephen R. Donaldson book, he, he's like, well, if this isn't real, or if it is real, we're going to find out now. <laughs> he chokes the hell out of Monica till she dies? Yeah, she doesn't even fight back. She just sits there. I felt like she kind of knew something that we didn't know. Yeah, yeah the, you know. the truth is, it's just, it's shock. I didn't see that coming. No. No, me either. It was so sudden. Well, the thing is, is you know, he was, uh, it, like you said, he Stretched didn't get offered anything. Yeah. He's going to get everything taken from him. And you know what? I'm going to kill this guy. And, he had, and, he, and, and, and at this point, he realized he has no power whatsoever. So he's lashing out with the only power he possibly has right now. Mm-hmm. Well, it might be the one thing that could uh, send him out of this place. Maybe. If the person really controlling it is Palmer and he really does die. Yeah. I can get Dude, out of 50, here. 50 50 chance because if this is Palmer's world and you have no power, maybe you die here too. And maybe he was like, I'm okay with that. They don't say anything right. like that. But I, 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 I was putting myself in that position and I'm like, stay here for an eternity and be tortured or controlled. No, I'd rather die because you're going to kill me anyway. So I might have done the same thing. So Bolero goes for a little walk after he's committed this murder. And he's trying to clear his head a little bit and understand what's going on. And he circles back around and he finds Dr. Smile. And he says, Dr. Smile, explain it to me. What's going on here? And Dr. Smile does try, at least. He says that you've already been given an injection to counteract the effects of Choosy. You will come out of the hallucination, as it were, someday. But it could, it could feel like centuries. It could feel like minutes. It's really hard to say. That's when I really got the prison idea. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it felt like it beforehand. It felt like he was being tortured beforehand. What if you forget that you're in there? Well, that's the thing. That it, this, to me, I already had the impression this was a kind of a sterile world with very limited uh, stimulation in general. Possibly created in haste? The thought of being stuck there for centuries with very little stimulation, I'm like, how long could I endure that? How long? We were talking about choice earlier. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If you are there and you have the ability to make stairs to go to New York, which Leo Bolero did, even though it wasn't his world, he's a prisoner, but he was able to make a believable reproduction of Ronnie, Barney, Mrs. Gleason, his office, people, a cab driver in New York City. Like, he could literally have forgotten, but it was only because Palmer put that thing under his desk that he remembered. True. True. So... Huh. People would forget. They would forget where they were very quickly. That's how they will enslave humanity. There's a paradox here that I don't comprehend. So he's talking to Dr. Smile, and Dr. Smile is explaining to him that, as you said, right now Palmer Eldritch is putting a counter agent intravenously into your system so that you can come out of the Chu Z experience. Um, so if you're here and, and there is no time here, how can you simultaneously know what's happening in the future? Because really no time has passed. So if you t- think of time as like a, literally a time, like a train moving, and on top of that train, you just you stop it because it's always moving, but you've got a tiny slice. But on top of that is an infinitely high pyramid. So the point is actually on the train at the point that you leave. So you can go anywhere you want in that pyramid, but at any time... To get out of that pyramid, it doesn't matter when you decide to stop it. You could live there for a billion years. And when you want to come out, you always come back to 
that specific point. You fall down back to the bottom of the pyramid. So that's your fail safe? Yeah, exactly. You always have to come out at exactly the same point, which is the point that you left. Does that make sense? It, it, that does make sense. I mean, to want to do it that way. Another thing that I thought was interesting, I was thinking of video games when we were talking about the the, glick, the glucks and uh, how like if you were on those video games that have like different screens that you have to solve and then go to the next one and you have like oh, a time yeah, limit. I like those. They would always have something that would come out and and uh, and and like threaten you to make sure you do something. You can't just you know you can't just sit on that screen and do nothing. Oh yeah. And, you know, like the timer is going, you know, and it's like something that's chasing you. And that's what the Gluck kind of reminded me of. Was it necessarily true that no time had to pass? Palmer Eldritch has said you might see a flutter of the eyelashes. Well, you remember when um, Palmer was explaining how this all worked to him in the beginning? He said that he had spent a century. Yeah, he he's plotting like, this I, takeover. Right. Not he plot- a century. He didn't say plotting the takeover. He said working with their medical staff to explore right. every possible means of how this works. Taking over this stuff. This this guy. Using they, it. Bringing it back to Earth, enslaving everybody. We still don't know why they well, would want well, to do he, such a he thing. He didn't say he was doing that. Yeah, but he had a century. You can infer it if you want to. And I'm choosing to. Because he had a century. To your point, yes, I could see how that is a very realistic possibility. But they never said that. And ten years, I just smoked this in a pipe. <laughs> well, but literally. And then for the next ten years, I shot it in my veins. That's what he did every decade. He just experimented on a different way to infuse, you know, put this in his body. He said for the Proxers, <laughs> it was like high quality tobacco, but for us, it, it has this. But for us, it is this uh... insanely different experience. I don't know if the Proxers were experimenting on him or he was just taking it to the limits because they're like, want to know how tobacco affects humans. But I imagine for him, he's just like, I'm not even going to tell them how amazing this stuff is. I'm not going to tell them because this is the most amazing stuff I've ever seen. And I just want to experience it fully so when I come back, I can mass market it. It's not him, though. It's not just him. He's working with them on some level. Yeah. Because when he says you're going to give us all of your stuff, he says we want all of your stuff or you're going to give us your stuff. He doesn't yeah. say me. Oh. And it's reinforced in this chapter at least one time that they are working together. On some level, he's working for them. I'm not convinced he is completely controlled by them. but at this Well, I'm not either. But, you know, they are in cahoots, let's say. Yeah. Yes. All right. So let's move on to the long walk because Dr. Smile has disintegrated. Well, he hasn't disintegrated, but his personality has disappeared because Palmer's no longer there to promote his existence. Leo goes for another walk, and he circles back around for whatever reason back to Dr. Smile. Hunched over the briefcase is this figure. He says it's bald, I believe, and it runs off. It, like, scampers away, and he recognizes it as a proxer. So one of those proxer things. He says tall, Mm -hmm. slender, with reed-like limbs and grotesque egg-shaped head. Nope. No, no, those are the other dudes. Those are the Terrans. Its bald head glistened as it gaped at him. Taken by surprise and then it leaped and rushed off his base. It's human and qua- or quasi-human. I thought that thing and the two things that came later were the same thing. No, the things that come later, if I'm not mistaken, are evolved humans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they're the final product of right. the Denkmal procedures. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we'll get to that in a second. So there's a Proxer in this world. Uh-huh. Oh. Just running around. He was so that was another the thing where I was thinking that like yeah. maybe this isn't Palmer Eldritch's fantasies or his trip that he brought Leo into. Maybe Dude, it can't be right. Or Palmer Eldritch, if everything is a manifestation of him, then the Proxer is a manifestation of him also. Nah, it can't be. That can't. can't At one be. moment, Palmer Eldritch is saying, "I want to take over the world," and then another one's like, "I'm this little girl." And then there's this other one that's like, I'm a proxer, too. Oh, No, that's not him. That no. is not Palmer Eldridge. Okay, if saying. anything, he's overstating his control in this place. And maybe the proxer is the one Because there are people control. here who don't know who he is, who are definitely not creations of his, even though they seem ephemeral, right? Yeah, it was, no. uh, and they said they were, they were hunting or they were like shooting proxers on site. They were arresting them. 
Oh, arresting them. I'm sorry. Yeah. He said because that, this place is sacred. This is Sigma 14B, in fact. Where does Leo live normally? Doesn't he live in like some apartment? Oh, no, that's the uh, Pooh Bear Estates, right? <laughs> this is not related. <laughs> well, sorry. he follows the Proxer for whatever reason. He thinks that's a great idea. And eventually he comes to a parked spaceship and two lounging individuals who were described as like hydrocephalatic. I can't say that word. They have like egg shaped heads. And he said, even from far away, it looked fragile. Yeah. <laughs> Their heads look fragile. But they don't have the rind. <laughs> but they said the resemblance was closer than to the Proxers than Terrans. It was closer to Terrans than Terrans Proxers. Terrans than Proxers. No, it says the resemblance yeah. was yeah. closer than. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, oh God. <laughs> oh, my God. Did I even read this chapter? It was, a, it was a funky worded sentence. I will give you that. This all of this information was on the same page, so apparently I only barely read that page. Nonetheless, uh, <laughs> uh, at first, well, when I thought they were shooting these guys on site instead of arresting them, I thought these were like hillbillies or something like I that. Yeah, you know, you know, when you start talking to them, they kind of have that 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 feel that this one of them is not very bright. These are futuristic hillbillies. Yes, one of them's using the wrong word all the time, and he's being corrected by his buddy. He yeah, says, instead of uh, he says defecate instead of desecrate, right. even though the desecration was probably defecation. No, it was urination. <laughs> it was urination. It, it was. I'm just playing with words. Just put a bug in my mind that this isn't real either. Like this is Doctor Smiles talking because he didn't get words right either. Doctor, you think this is Doctor Smile? I I don't know, but it can it didn't convince me that what I'm seeing is real. No, I agree. It's 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 a strange one. Yeah. But it does. Okay, so hmm. there is a plaque here on a column Ooh. celebrating the death of Palmer Eldritch, the Renegade. He was defeated in fair combat by Leo Bolero, the hero of the Nine Planets. And this place is sacred to Terrans. And so any Proxer that shows up here, they arrest them on site for trespass. Because they keep showing up and trying to desecrate this place. But they're very curious because this is where their hero died. Well, there's a point where Leo Bolero tries to shake hands with one of these future humans, evolved humans, and his hand passes right through them. And it freaks him out. They're like, oh my god, you're not really here. And yet, they're, they're like statistically as there as the possible future. They're like 40% likely to be there. So they're probably 40% real. You know, you can see Ooh. them, but they're not really all there yet because that's just a possibility for the future. It sure, was, it can Palmer change. Eldridge said that he liked his odds, that he was going to take his chances, that it was only like 48% likely that he would lose, something to that effect, which means he could still lose. It's basically a, toy, a coin toss. Who's going to come up on top right now? So I think that this is a ephemeral future, a possible ephemeral future. And notice where they said they were. They said they were on Sigma 14B. So that stuff, Choosy, it sent them to Sigma 14B. It didn't send them to the domain on Luna. It didn't send them someplace else. Like, Well, do you remember Dr. Smith in the last chapter, Smile. chapter 5? Doctor, sorry, Dr. Smiles in, in chapter 5 said that it told uh, Barney Mayerson that Leo Bolero was on Sigma 16B. Yeah, but I, I think they inferred that. Was that really true that was Felix Blau, and he inferred it because the signal was probably coming from Sigma 14B. Well, either That's way, this gets kind of... It's muddy. It is a li So Leo's a hero in this <laughs> world. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. He is. Leo's got to like the, that. What, I mean, the, the greater question here is, like, what are we seeing? What What is real here? And what is this world? And why are they there? And who's there? And how, why are the Proctors there? How is Eldritch there? How is Leo there? How are these random two guys there? And how is it infinite in time? And I... Questions, questions, questions. Yes, question, question. It was, it was, I agree. I agree. There's a lot that we have to ask, and there's a lot of no answers. For this chapter, at least. I, I assume we're going to get tons of good information in the future, but if every chapter is like the last two chapters, we're doomed. We'll never understand. <laughs> we have no chance. The important thing that comes out of this part is that Leo's pretty much, uh, uh, he knows what he has to do, right? 
Uh, well, he knows that he's on the right track as far as he's opposing Palmer Eldritch. When the dog yeah. shows up and desecrates the the column by urinating on it, and they have that yeah. humorous little exchange, like that to me was the indication that this is all a percentage chance for the future, right? Because that was Palmer Eldritch as a dog coming and pissing on the thing that where he got killed. Right. Right? Oh, is that what you think? Yeah, I think they said. I it. think that's what they think. Yeah, I didn't invent that. They they said that was him, or somebody said that was him. But they also believe that Leo Bolero is a ghost and that maybe... Uh, he kind of is, if you think about it. They refer to them as choosers, the phantoms that show up here occasionally. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, that's anybody that uses choosy is what you're saying. Why do they show up here? So when you use choosy, you don't control the area that you're in. You get transported to an area that you can have some modicum of effect on, potentially. I wonder if they don't all go to a prison, which is Sigma 14B, which was constructed for the express purpose of housing the Terrans. Right. Right. They refer to it as a moon in this section. It wasn't a satellite. Uh, it was referred to as a moon. So it's huge. Huh. But this is in the future, right? I thought. Yeah, it's got to be the future. It has to be at least a couple of decades hence. Uh, because it's been it's been discovered that the Proxers were artificially affecting the Earth's climate and making it hotter, and they don't need that garbage anymore. The the chitinous skin that they had, they don't need that Climbing anymore. Skin. Yeah, it did they say it, out. it did say, and I thought that was fascinating that the Proxers were doing that to to Earth the entire time. So to make it unpleasant for them, so they'd be more likely to go into a layout. Ah, uh... I mean maybe. Um, I don't know. Like you said, the, the wheels are turning. The sons of bitches is what I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah. It, like I said. It, I, I'm anti-proxer now all the way. All it the way. sounds like it's all coming together that everything is being, like, we are being cattle herded into uh, our future. And there's not a gosh darn thing we can do about it. I kind of said something, I think, last chapter incoherently about capitalism. Yes, you did. <laughs> that episode comes out tonight, by the way. And I think that it uh, it feels it, it, that is an aspect of imprisonment. We're self-imprisoning, which we would we do did. if we were given perfect VR. This guy go. was talking about this long before. I mean, what is yes. this, like 2000-something or <laughs> I forget? Well, it's, it's, um, like, it's like when the Matrix came out. I don't know. Well, I look at this a little bit different. It's, it's almost like Ready Player mm -hmm. One. Go on. Well, no, it's just that people... I don't know anything Earth, about it. Earth, Can't speak All right, it. shame on you. You need to watch that because you grew up in the 80s. So, no, I don't. Uh, this virtual reality simulation came out where people could choose to go to it, and everybody did. Like, everybody. It's the most popular game in the world. Yeah, it went in. And, you know, it could be... Any, you could, there's an infinite variety, seemingly infinite variety, of places and things you could experience in that world compared to the world you live in, which kind of isn't probably isn't that great yeah, it's overcrowded you, and everybody's poor in. yep everybody's got to play the same characters so right well the matrix the stuff the, the like the philosophy behind the matrix and what's that guy's name that did the uh bostrom nick bostrom who did the simulation hypothesis that's you, actually been around for a very, very... You don't know? Okay, fine. It's the simulation hypothesis. It's, but it's the matrix, essentially. Right? Are we living in a simulation? This argument's been going right. on for a very, 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 very long time. Like, probably as long as Erasmus and, uh, and Luther have been around. It's just been in different forms. It's couched in different forms. And this is just another iteration of that same quandary what well, well that came up or so is it the f is it the fact that even if we are in the matrix and we know it or don't know it that we'll still like again subjugate or i mean i'm not entering the w matrix and working a nine to five ever yeah, you again would. You yeah know you what would because you no, you i'm not know. you would forget that you were in the matrix don't upset me. I'm never going to go in the Matrix and work a nine to five. Dude, you might already be there, and you just don't know it. No. Well, it's so just... it's called solipsism. Is the philosophy, and it says it's called about the self is all that can be known to exist. Like for sure, all that you know for sure is that you exist. It's like I think, therefore I am. Do you know you exist when you're asleep? That's a good question. <laughs> 
Mm. I might be tricked that I exist, but who knows? I, I get your point. I just wasn't familiar with that name. But the philosophy I get, nothing exists beyond the self. All right, let's wind this chapter down, yeah? Yeah. He is allowed to leave. He's put back into that gaggle of reporters that he arrived with. They haven't even had their interview. And no time has passed. No time has passed. Exactly. Yeah, he's like, well, at least that's true. <laughs> oh, my geez. What a chapter, though. I mean, to be honest, this took a very long time for me to read because I didn't understand a lot of what was happening. And, like, a lot of the things that I thought were supposed to be conveyed to me, I didn't pick up. So, not clumsy necessarily, just required a really slow, methodical reading. And if you just bl- breeze through it, okay, fine. You know, you understand there's some, oh, my God, what's going on? These people, oh, it's so strange. But I wanted to understand it, so I took my time. And I still don't understand it, so maybe that was a mistake. <laughs> what I got out of it, it was absolutely unclear what was real and what wasn't real. And that may be the point, because that was kind of the what... point of the last chapter. You know, it was like that reality and false reality are indistinguishable. I love this chapter. I thought it was the best one so far. Really? Yeah, 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 really. Um, Like, there was uh, other chapters where we had, like, you know, strong characterization. We had the, the, you know, conversation about the the shrink in a briefcase and everything. But um, the the total mind effing that's going on in this chapter was super fun. So there was this program on FX called Legion. And uh, it's a comic book based uh, program. Professor X's kid, he's nuts and has all these, you know, crazy powers. And every episode was like, is this real? Is this not? And it's like, it just piles on. And it's like, I don't want to watch that over and over and over again. I can really appreciate it. This was not like that, though. This was very informational and con- in conjunction with the last chapter when Leo's, you know, imprisoned. Um, it was one long chapter. You should read that part along with this. And I, oh, yeah. again, there's a lot of things that I got to wonder about. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. you know, what is real? What isn't real? Uh, but what is being told to us that is real <laughs> is also very important. You can sift out some pretty important details and you can make some inferences along the way. And it, it I mean, it's getting, in my opinion, more and more scary. Like it's getting to look like, you know, mass enslavement. I rebelled against Yule's first assertion that this was the best chapter, but on reflecting upon every chapter, like mentally of the last few seconds, I feel like it's finally coming, it's building, and building in a hard way, or there's a turning point right here, and it was a very hard chapter to read, but if you really reread it, so to speak, so you can comprehend something better, I, I agree. Yule, you're absolutely right. This is my This is the best chapter so far. Oh, thanks. And it's not even half over. I feel like if this was an action movie, Barney Marison's going to come in with guns ablazing to save you, Leo. Get, you know, stuff like that. But he's going to come um, in with a broom. Yeah, it was. It was very. That's exactly right. That's what he did. Come he in, came with, in a broom. with a broom. That's the chapter title right here. Coming in with a broom. Yeah. Coming in. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. We're going to get back to reading. We'll see you back here in a few days' time with chapter seven. Goodbye. Thank you all. 